Good morning. It's great to see all of you here today in this beautiful day in Sacramento. I hope you're not too sad that you're missing it, but you'll be out soon and you can enjoy the weather. We love the weather. I'd like to welcome everyone here today to our Congressional Forum on Net Neutrality. It's great to be here in the state capitol, and I'd like to thank those of you in the audience for coming to hear this important discussion on the future of the Internet. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are watching this online. The debate happening right now in Washington, D.C. over net neutrality is critically important, but it should not be confined to the halls of the federal bureaucracy alone. This is one of the central reasons I have brought this hearing to my district in Sacramento, the capital of our great state of California. This hearing will be part of the Energy and Commerce Committee record thanks to Ranking Member Henry Waxman of California. This format will be the same as our committee hearings in Washington, D.C. For the last few months, I've been calling on the FCC to take the net neutrality show on the road and listen to and engage with Americans on the impact that the current net neutrality proposal put forth by Chairman Wheeler will have on consumers, entrepreneurs, small business, and other stakeholders. To that point, I am very pleased that we have two FCC commissioners with us today, Commissioner Mignon Clyburn and Commissioner Jessica Rosenwurzel. These two accomplished commissioners have a reputation of making thoughtful and fair-minded decisions on the policy challenges facing our innovation economy whether it's expanding broadband to lower income communities, schools, and libraries, or unleashing more spectrum and ensuring interoperability so our mobile devices can perform nationwide. Commissioners Clyburn and Rosenwurzel have championed a diverse set of critical communications issues in the public interest. In fact, recently, both commissioners were named by the prestigious National Journal as leading women in the country who shape technology po policy. We are fortunate, very fortunate, they travel from Washington, D.C. to be here today to share their views and engage in this important topic. And we all know that the Internet is a very personal thing to all Americans. We use the Internet for just about everything we do today. Reading the news, applying for a job, taking educational classes, dreaming or looking at a actually screen, streaming a TV show or starting a business. The digital economy is an integral part of our lives, but so many times we just take it for granted. So when it comes, it seems like the Internet as we know it today may change, and not for the better. Americans do speak up, and that is what we're seeing today. Earlier this year, the D.C. Circuit Court struck down two of the FCC's 2010 Open Internet Rules, which maintain a basic level of protection for consumers and innovators on the Internet. In response, Chairman Wheeler presented a proposal to restore these protections that have received a lot of attention across the country. Over 3.7 million comments have been filed with the Commission, which is absolutely a record-setting number for FCC proceedings, even more than the Janet Jackson malfunction, <laughs> which I think was only about 1.5. <laughs> now, I have personally heard from hundreds of my own constituents here in Sacramento about the importance of preserving an open Internet. I've heard from Liam, who wrote to me that Chairman Wheeler's proposal to allow the Internet fast lanes would cripple people's ability to get the content they need for everyone, for everything from building a small business to strengthening community involvement. Gage wrote to me saying that the net neutrality was the most important free speech issue today and that competition between business on the Internet was possible because major companies all offered access to the same connection speed. Matt wrote, as Californians, our tech-based economy needs an open and fast Internet or we may not be able to keep up with other nations. These are only a few of the hundreds of emails and calls I received in response 
the chairman wheeler's current net neutrality proposal i agree with many of my constituents that the current net neutrality proposal by chairman wheeler is severely flawed it would up and the basic principle that has guided the internet's growth since its inception that all data must be treated equally specifically i believe that the practice of paid prioritization by broadband providers would dramatically would dramatically reshuffle the digital deck it would alter the public's unfettered ability to access content online and threaten competition and innovation pay prioritization would allow a broadband provider the ability to offer preferential treatment to one content provider over another for a fee if the final fcc proposal allows this to become reality consumer choice would be will be at the mercy of the highest bidder and it would create a two-tiered internet leading to fast lanes for some and slow lanes for others in a nutshell pay prioritization is a tax on innovation and consumer choice in fact the only certainty that paid prioritization would bring to the internet ecosystem is that it would stifle creativity investment and squeeze out new competition it would prevent the next google or amazon from hitting the digital economy americans are not standing for that and i'm not standing for that that's why i along with senator patrick leahy of vermont introduced the online competition and consumer choice act which requires the fc to exercise its legal authority to ban paid prioritization agreements or so-called internet fast lane between isps and content providers on the last mile internet connection to residential consumers or small business i am hopeful that the fcc will ultimately propose a set of rules later this year that preserves net neutrality and spurs innovation and consumer choice there needs to be transparency there needs to be openness of the internet i'm also hopeful that the chairman's final net neutrality proposal will prevent pay prioritization agreements from entering the marketplace there is no room in our economy for this sort of anti-competitive practice Today, we have a great panel of witnesses. We have a California PUC commissioner. We have a Sacramento librarian. We have a venture capitalist. We have a Sacramento public broadcaster. And we have a Hollywood screenwriter and producer. All of our panelists offer unique perspectives about the critical role the internet plays in our lives and the importance of protecting an open internet. And I look forward to hearing from them shortly. But I also know many of you here today and those watching online have comments you'd like to share about how the FCC's current net neutrality proposal would impact you. To that end, I have set up an email address, Matsui, M-A-T-S-U-I, underscore public comments, one word, at mail.house.gov, that you can email your comments to. And please know, I will share these closely with the commissioners, and also with Chairman Wheeler. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Now, I will now yield to Commissioner Clyburn for an opening statement. Thank you, and good morning. <clears throat> Congresswoman Matsui, I really appreciate you hosting this congressional forum, which focuses on what I believe is one of the most important issues before the Federal Communications Commission today, retaining and promoting a free and open internet for everyone. The Congresswoman clearly understands the importance of a free internet, and I appreciate her leadership on this, as well as many other issues, including broadband adoption and lifeline. I sincerely appreciate the invitation to participate and believe it is important to hear the views of interested parties outside of the Beltway. This hearing, as the Congresswoman noted, will be a part of the House Energy and Commerce Committee record and I am pleased to note that the forum and materials available will also be a part of the official Federal Communications Commission record in the open internet docket 1428, so your voices from Sacramento and beyond will be heard. Speaking of voices, as you've heard, 
Over 3,700,000 have spoken, and we are listening. These numbers speak volumes of the tremendous impact the impact the Internet has had on our society. Consumers, entrepreneurs, librarians, teachers, doctors, writers, venture capitalists, state officials, edge providers, content providers, filed comments in our proceeding wanting the FCC to know their views. For many, this marks the first time they have participated in a government proceeding and highlights not only the importance of a free and open Internet, but the power such openness has to encourage civic engagement. As a public servant, I believe my mission is to listen to the voices of consumers and give voice to those who may be unable to speak. As the FCC moves forward to consider permanent rules, my focus will be on the impact on consumers, something that I fear has gotten lost in this debate over 706 versus Title II and the parsing through each word of the D.C. Circuit's decision. The legal issues are, of course, important, but to me, it puts the cart before the horse. The critical question, as I see it, is first determining the right policy, and when that is established, then and only then determine we should the appropriate legal framework to achieve that result. So just what does this mean to focus on consumers? It means ensuring that those consumers continue to pick winners and losers, not companies giving priority or the government dictating a result, for this is the free market at its best, and that free market needs to be preserved. It also means looking at how consumers are using the Internet over fixed and mobile devices. We must ask and determine what are the trends so we can craft rules that are flexible enough. We need to ask what is the demand and what are the projections? What proportion of traffic is mobile versus fixed? One trend is clear, the increased reliance on mobile broadband. Mobile broadband looks quite different than it did in 2010 when the FCC adopted different open Internet rules for mobile versus fixed. The deployment of LTE was in its infancy in 2010 with 200,000 LTE subscribers today. There are over 120 million, and LTE has been deployed to a projected 300 million Americans. The use of Wi-Fi has also increased, and the trend suggests it will continue to do so. Cisco projects that 52 percent of mobile, traf mobile data traffic will be offloaded to Wi-Fi by 2018, and from the consumer's perspective, they often do not know whether they are using cellular data or Wi-Fi because the transition is seamless. To me, this means that we need to be careful to avoid creating differing or conflicting standards or rules for Wi-Fi and mobile. Along with increases in mobile broadband, the number of Americans who rely exclusively on a mobile device, according to a recent Pew Research report, is 41% and that is up from 29% in 2010. For lower income Americans, 56% are wireless only, and that is up from 39% in 2010, and for Latinos of all income levels. The number of wireless only households is 53%, up from 38% in 2010. For many of these lower income and Latino consumers, their mobile device is their only access to broadband if they have broadband at all. Given these trends, I will be focusing on my review, my review on how different proposals will impact the consumer's experience. What is the impact on a consumer whose mobile broadband may, may be her only access to broadband? If we have lower standards for mobile, will providers make clear that the experience may be different Will consumers understand that apps or content could be blocked? And if we have a different standard, will it disproportionately impact communities that rely on their mobile device for connectivity as we continue this debate and review? I vow to remain focused on the consumer impact. My door remains open. 
and I will be listening to you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner Rosenworcel, your opening statement. Good morning. It's always good to get out of Washington, and it's terrific to be here in Sacramento. So thank you to Congresswoman Matsui for being such a dynamo and thought leader back in Washington, for holding this hearing, and for having me here today. It's also a treat to be here with my friend and colleague, Commissioner Clyburn, and I'm grateful to each and every one of our witnesses for joining us today. So let's start with what we know. I know this, our application, our internet economy is the envy of the world. We invented it. The applications economy began right here on our shores, and some would say right here in this state. The broadband below us and the airwaves all around us deliver its collective might to our homes and businesses and communities across the country. What produced this dynamic engine of entrepreneurship and experimentation is a foundation of openness. Sustaining what has made us innovative, fierce, and creative should not be a choice. It should be an obligation. We also have a duty, a duty to protect what has made the Internet the most dynamic platform for free speech ever invented. It is our printing press. It is our town square. It is our individual soapbox and our collective platform for opportunity. That's why I support network neutrality. I believe the FCC must find a way to put open internet policies back in place because we cannot have a two-tiered internet with fast lanes that speed the traffic of the privileged and leave the rest of us lagging behind. Because, as you will probably hear today, paid prioritization can be a tax on innovation. So, as we look for a way forward, I am pleased that FCC Chairman Wheeler has recently acknowledged that all options, including Title II, remain on the table. And as we proceed, we must also be mindful of the more than 3.7 million people who have written the agency to express their opinion. Openness and transparency matter too. It's good the FCC is hosting internet roundtables back in Washington, but we should be open to more than holding discussions inside our building, inside the Beltway. Because this is big, really big. So kudos to all of you for being here today. I wish all my colleagues were here and that we would hold discussions just like this with every commissioner present in communities all across the country. So now for the best part. I stop talking and we get to hear from you. So thank you, Sacramento, and thank you, Congresswoman Matsui, for making this happen. Thank you, Commissioner Rosenwartso, for being here, and Commissioner Clyburn. Uh, before I start with the witnesses, I wanted to enter a letter from Senator Padilla, who is the chairman of the California State Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Communications, and author of the legislation promoting broadband deployment and adoption into the record of this hearing, and copies of this will be available on the table. Now we'll move to testimony from the very important people who are here today, our witnesses. Each witness will have up to five minutes for an opening statement, so if you can keep it within five minutes, it would be great. First of all, I would like to introduce our first witness, Commissioner Catherine Sandoval of the California Public Utilities Commission. Commissioner Sandoval was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown on January 2011 to serve as Commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission. Her appointment and confirmation to the post made her the first Latina to serve as CPUC Commissioner in the agency's 100-year history. She serves as a Vice Chair of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners Telecommunications Committee. Long title there. Commissioner Sandoval is also a tenured professor at Santa Clara University School of Law. Thank you, 
Commissioner Sandoval for being here today and you can proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Congresswoman Matsui for convening this important forum in Sacramento in California and for inviting me and all of the witnesses to be here today and to speak. And special thanks to Commissioners Clyburn and Rosenworcel for coming out to California and for encouraging these public forums. I also wanted to especially thank both of you, Commissioner Clyburn and Rosenworcel, for your separate statements in the Open Internet NPRM. Both of you said that you would have done it differently, and I concur. As a Commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission and also a member of the Federal State Joint Services, uh, uh, Joint Board on Advanced Services, uh, along with Commissioner Rosenworcel and Commissioner Clyburn has been the appointed Commissioner to that board, um, I believe it is very important to have a free and open internet and I'd like to talk to you about why this is absolutely critical not only to American freedom but to American public safety. The FCC's proposal to allow ISPs to require individualized, differentiated, non-transparent negotiations is dangerous to public safety, to public health, the open internet, the American economy, and democracy. America's critical infrastructure sectors have high reliability and safety duties and need an open and reliable internet with low transaction and access costs. FCC, in its open internet proceeding, the FCC defined edge providers who might be subject to negotiations to include all content providers. And the definition is so broad as to include everyone, all individuals, all organizations who use the internet. It even specifically contemplates an individual musician with a YouTube video. Now, I have several YouTube videos where I ask people to conserve energy in the light of the outage of the San Onofre nuclear power plant, when in one minute, Southern California lost 20% of its power and conservation was critical to prevent blackouts. Now, the California brown bear is getting more hits than I'm getting on his YouTube video to encourage people to save water in light of our <laughs> California's terrible drought. But this is just an example of how energy, water, and critical infrastructure uses the open internet. Internet access delayed due to ISP bargaining with energy utilities or third parties could hamper critical safety and reliability operations and harm public safety. Internet enabled systems are used to open and close pumps and in sub SCADA systems to operate various devices. Internet enabled systems are also used to ask people or internet enabled devices, the internet of things, to reduce energy demand and can stave blackouts, can prevent blackouts. It can also increase lighting when unauthorized people are near remote utility plants or light up the way for an ambulance along the way to the hospital. Subjecting internet access to negotiations and slowdowns to minimum speeds can make pumps fail to open so they don't provide water for cooling a power plant or water to fight a fire. Minimum speeds are not enough. This can have devastating, deadly, and cascading consequences. <laughs> Some high reliability and safety energy, water, and communication systems are not directly connected to the open internet to preserve cybersecurity and reliability. If the internet became more unreliable due to negotiations that hold up access, more systems would have to be switched to non-internet enabled services, creating disincentives to invest in such systems and making it more difficult to secure regulatory approval to spend ratepayer money on such systems. The CPUC has approved internet-enabled electronic records keeping for gas pipeline operators. This provides fast access, which is critical in responding to emergencies. Failure to maintain records in a safe and reliable fashion has been charged as a criminal violation under the Federal Pipeline Safety Act. The public, utilities, and regulators need internet access to be speedy and reliable so utilities can recall records when needed and prevent injury, explosions, and loss of life or damage to property. In last month's 6.0 Napa earthquake, PG&E deployed a new internet-enabled technology, Picaro, to detect natural gas leaks after the ground shaking disturbed gas pipelines. The CPUC approved the use of Picaro in July of 2014 because it detects gas leaks at a rate 1,000 times better than old techniques. Picaro was born through an open internet. 
as its inventor realized that it could use the methane detection technology that it developed for a completely different purpose to detect gas pipeline leaks. And then he was able to map that, what he detected, the leaks that he detected through Google Earth and enable through mobile broadband access to be able to have pipeline technicians use those maps through using mobile tablets and phones to go to pinpoint places and fix leaks prioritized by Picaro by severity. Innovation was fast and affordable due to the open internet, making it an affordable and efficient and effective investment for rate payers. Picaro and PG&E didn't have to negotiate with ISPs to get access to the internet at fast speeds or at speeds for which they contracted, or to be able to send these fat GIS-based files. PG&E's customers, Californians, and all of us are counting on this technology to increase safety and to save rate payer money. The CPUC also runs a California Teleconnect Fund, and my colleague, Commissioner Peterman, is the assigned commissioner to that proceeding. Our fund also expands on E-rates and provides discounts to internet-supported uh, services at schools, libraries, healthcare centers, and nonprofits. The California Telehealth Network also supports rural telecommunications and enables life-saving diagnosis and treatment. For stroke patients, seconds count. Brain, function saving, uh, brain and function saving medicine, TPA, works best if it's given right away and must be injected or delivered by, by IV within 60 minutes of a stroke to be most effective in minimizing brain damage. Through the telehealth network and our investments, UC Davis stroke specialists are able to diagnose a patient at a rural hospital using high-speed, high-resolution cameras to detect whether the patient is having a stroke. Accurate diagnosis is a prerequisite to being able to administer the medicine. Doctors working to save lives and with a duty of care and patients relying on the fast internet connections and the telehealth network have already bargained for, uh, for contracts to assure their access to an internet. And for that internet, speed matters and minimum speeds wouldn't cut it. The FCC proposal greatly increases transaction costs to the internet and could increase internet fees. It will facilitate anti-competitive bargaining to raise rivals' costs to get faster speeds than competitors. Doing so raises market manipulation issues in regulated markets such as FERC-administered energy markets. Call completion problems could also blossom as traffic from rural carriers and other common carriers and VOAP companies can't get through during ISP negotiations. And Lifeline, which we have, also worked, uh, have, we have also worked so hard on, could have its verification efforts frustrated by ISP negotiations or slowdown, as, for example, California verifies 100% of Lifeline applicants through Internet-enabled platforms. And with our new extension of Lifeline to mobile, we are now adding more than 30,000 Internet, um, uh, Internet customers and Lifeline customers a month 100% of them verified for eligibility through internet-enabled applications. So in closing, to protect an open internet, the FCC must use both Section 706 and Title II with forbearance and a light regulatory touch. Thank you again for your consideration and for holding this important forum. Thank you very much, Commissioner Sandoval. I would now like to welcome our next witness, Rivka Sass. Executive Director of the Sacramento Library System. Rivka is one of the most forward-thinking and creative librarians in the country. She brings over 30 years of as experience as a librarian. She has been named National Librarian of the Year by the Library Journal. Rivka has been a leading voice on telecommunications issues facing national libraries and has testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee in Washington, D.C on national broadband adoption policies. We're all lucky that Rivka is in Sacramento and in charge of our library system. Thank you, Rivka, for being here today, and you may proceed with your testimony. You, uh, yeah. There we go. There Sorry. We Good. I'm going to start over with your. <laughs> well, the light went on. I should have known. <laughs> Sorry. 
Congresswoman Matsui, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today at this congressional forum on net neutrality. I also want to thank FCC Commissioners Clyburn and Rosenworcel for your leadership on this important issue. The subject that we're discussing today is critical to the Sacramento Public Library Authority. Our community, and indeed our library, is a microcosm of America. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here to represent our community of users. Sacramento Public Library is the fourth largest library in California. We serve 1.4 million people at 28 locations. We're proud to serve one of the most diverse communities in America and to provide services that prepare young children to be ready for school, to help children after school with their homework, to help job seekers apply for jobs online and to help adults who fell through the cracks of our educational system complete their GEDs and now we're the second library in the United States to be able to offer an online accredited high school diploma and we're very proud of that. Most importantly, Sacramento Public Library provides free and open access to information in all of its many formats. Two policies govern Sacramento Public Library's philosophy of access. It's our collection development policy, which our board approved in 2011, and the library's internet access policy, also board approved in 2007. Our collection policy affirms that the fundamental role that the library's collection plays in, in a successful community is free access to information. As a librarian with more than three decades of experience in the profession, I've seen the formats come and go, but the principles of information access remain the same. Access to the internet is simply one more tool that allows librarians to bring people and information together. The principles that guide our collection policy also guide the internet access policy, which states the Sacramento Public Library provides public access to the internet as part of its mission to deliver services and materials to meet the information needs of its customers. Library users in Sacramento County depend on equal access to the internet. We're witness daily to the opportunities that this access offers to them to improve their education and job skills, to find employment, and to contribute to our local economy. An open internet is a, not a privilege for the affluent. It is the right of each and every one of us. Internet resources must remain affordable for libraries and freely accessible to those we serve. Without this guarantee, there is a danger that libraries will face higher service charges for so-called premium access, and that could result in for-profit colleges or other commercial ventures having faster access than, say, a library or a community college. Even more devastating in my mind is a model that would take a child to a commercial service but leave behind library curated resources so that they don't have access to them. We must not allow a system of internet access in this country that would set limits on bandwidth or speed because of paid prioritized transmission. Such a scheme would only increase the gap that already exists between the haves and the have-nots. Imagine the consequences. Libraries would be forced to just turn off access to vital information for those who need it most. We cannot afford to be a society where information is available only to those with the means to purchase it. Let's prohibit paid prioritization. Let's prohibit access to websites, applications, and internet services, I'm sorry, and internet-based services, and please let's provide transparency around network management. That's why I, as, along with the American Library Association, support legislation introduced by you, Congresswoman Matsui, and Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont that would prohibit paid prioritized agreements. The Internet functions best when it's open to everyone without interference by Internet access providers. Paid prioritization is inherently unfair and it could be particularly harmful to libraries and educational institutions research and learning organizations that do not have access to pay additional fees. There should be no difference in the open internet rules for wired and wireless services. We heard 
why this morning the number of people simply who use only mobile devices. Technology and distinctions that would justify such a difference no longer exist if they ever did. And the role of mobile services in education, research, and learning continues to expand, highlighting the importance of an open internet regardless of the mode by which it is accessed. Over the last few months, we've seen that record number of people, 3.7 million Americans, take time to share their voices and their opinions on the open internet proposal put forth by the FCC chairman. I believe the commission should go through the public comments carefully and develop a final net neutrality proposal that will include strong, <laughs> transparent, and enforceable rules. The rules should not be allowed, should not allow unfettered access to internet traffic. The rules should allow unfettered access to internet traffic in a non-discriminatory manner and to preserve the culture and the tradition of the internet as an open platform for research, education, and the exchange of information. An internet that is anything but open and equally accessible for each and every one of us isn't really an option in my opinion. I want to thank you, Congresswoman Matsui, for your leadership on this issue and for scheduling today's forum here in Sacramento. I applaud you for your strong stance. And thank you, FCC Commissioners Clyburn and Rosenmorsel, for making the trip here and for making sure that we all have the opportunity to allow our voices to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Rivka. <laughs> now I'd like to welcome our next witness, Chris Kelly, founder of Kelly Investments. Chris brings a wealth of experience and expertise on investing in the Internet ecosystem. He's a founder of Kelly Investments, a successful venture capitalist firm that invests in internet companies and technology startups. He's also a minority owner of the Sacramento Kings NBA team. Previously, Chris served as chief privacy officer and general counsel for Facebook. Like myself, Chris is also a veteran of the Clinton White House. He served as policy advisor in the White House for President Clinton's Domestic Policy Council. Thank you, Chris, for being here today. Thank you so much, Congressman Matsui, for the opportunity to come here. And I'm deeply appreciative of Commissioners Clyburn and Rosenmorsel for joining us as well. The story of the Internet is the story of being able to reach millions of people, and importantly, to have millions of people reach you with ease and low cost. It has inspired thousands upon thousands of people, young and old, to take entrepreneurial chances that seem irrational at the time that they're made, but end up transforming the world for the better. The paid prioritization that was not just possible, but nearly explicitly endorsed in the first proposal by Chairman Wheeler in, in, the net neutral, in his first net neutrality proposal would rapidly destroy that story and threaten our economy. We're hearing from the technology industry with a single voice, both from small upstarts and those who've now built companies seen as cash cows who can afford to pay by some telecommunications providers, that a real commitment to net neutrality is critical to the future of American innovation. Facebook, the company that I have the most direct experience through my service in a variety of roles from 2005 to 2009, including as general counsel, chief privacy officer, and head of global public policy, would have been unlikely to grow from its college roots without the de facto net neutrality that has prevailed to this point and must continue to prevail in the future. While well, Facebook, Google, eBay, Netflix, and the other targets of irresponsible telecommunications providers seeking to double dip by charging at both ends of their internet plumbing may be able to survive the up and coming upstarts that are critical to Silicon Valley's, Sacramento's, and our nation's future would be deeply harmed by the innovation tax that is paid prioritization. Please assure the American people, more than 3.7 million who have taken moments out of their days on what seems like an obscure technical issue to speak to the FCC, please assure them that the FCC will stand with consumers, with the kid in the dorm room or a high school student working from her parents' house with a better idea for how the Internet should work, and with the Internet industry as a whole, that you will ban paid prioritization. I've happily reinvested in the Internet industry, helping to build film innovator Fandor, fee-free financial services provider Loyal3 that is helping broaden Amer ownership in American companies, and many other apps and services that simplify people's lives. Reaching people easily and quickly through the Internet without having to pay an innovation tax for delivery is critical to the success of all these businesses. 
Abrogation of net neutrality will allow irresponsible providers to choke innovation and further entrench incumbents and their consumer hostile visions of the Internet's future. As an investor in the Internet ecosystem, paid prioritization schemes would no doubt stifle precious capital and investment in the digital economy. We cannot allow that to happen. It's not just the technology industry, but some responsible telecommunications providers who are endorsing the principles that we seek to protect. We're thankful that some are making explicit commitments and endorsing a meaningful and active FCC regulatory response in this area. As Washington found out when it tried to jam through SOPA and PIPA without due consideration, Silicon Valley and the Internet industry as a whole are ready and willing to engage in the public discourse once they understand the stakes. As a veteran of the Clinton administration, where I had the pleasure of working with Congresswoman Matsui, who made his way back to Silicon Valley, I've often been frustrated by Silicon Valley's lack of focus on the policymaking process. But when that policymaking process becomes captive to entrenched interests, we've now learned to rise up quickly and effectively. I have no doubt that the poor public reaction to Chairman Wheeler's initial proposed plan has driven the 3.7 million public comments. Silicon Valley is ready to assure that net neutrality is the law of the land, and we hope that the FCC's final rules later this year will see its way back to this position again. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this forum, and I look forward to engaging with you further in the process. Thank you, Chris. I would now like to welcome our next witness, David Lowe, who is president and executive producer of KVIE, a very successful public broadcast station in Sacramento. KVIE is California's second longest running public television station, serving nearly 1.4 million households. David is KVIE's sixth president of his 55-year history. He is an Emmy award-winning executive producer and has been nominated the last two years for station excellence. He's also the president of California Public Television. His previous experience includes roles with a startup and a publicly traded software company. Much of KVIE's program is now available online. Thank you, David, for being here today. Thank you, Congresswoman Matsui. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today at this Congressional Forum on Net Neutrality, and I also appreciate Commissioners Clyburn and Rosenworcel for participating in this important forum. I've been with KVIE, the PBS station in Sacramento, since 2001, and have served as President and General Manager since 2008. KVIE appreciates the opportunity to share our views with this forum on this very important subject. As providers of video content with an ever-growing number of our viewers accessing our content online, it is important to us that those viewers have full, unrestricted access to the wide array of educational content and services that we provide on whatever platform they wish to receive it. For more than four decades, public television stations have led the way in harnessing new technologies to deliver innovative educational content. KVIE and other local PBS stations complement on-air broadcast services by making educational and other non-commercial content and services available on IP-based platforms such as KVIE.org, PBS.org, and PBSKids.org, as well as streaming video services, social media, blogs, and interactive educational video games and mobile apps. KVIE is working diligently to keep pace with the Internet ecosystem and our viewer online demands. Our online KVIE videos had more than 8.2 million views through multiple portals, KVIE and PBS websites, YouTube, the PBS app for iPhone and iPad, the AOL On Network, and more. Mobile viewing of KVIE.org grew from 4% to 19% in just two years. Audiences nationwide engaged with our local production, America's Heartland, online. This expanded reach has allowed people throughout the country to connect with KVIE and learn more about the people and the issues affecting the Sacramento region. No longer does someone need to live in a broadcast area to find out what is going on in other parts of the country. From children to teachers and caregivers, from career training to lifelong learners, education lies at the heart of what we do in public television. Nationwide, stations like KVIE offer hundreds of local learning initiatives for all stages of life. From the inception of public television, we have been committed and rooted in this educational mission, and so it is only natural that our online presence is largely focused on our educational impact. What, we, what began with Sesame Street over 45 years ago now encompasses a whole children's educational lineup that has reached more than 90 million children and runs from literacy to STEM to social-emotional education available anytime, anywhere for every child. 
what is universally free and available to every household in this nation in broadcast form is now also widely and increasingly available as online videos and as games and mobile apps that enhance the learning experience. Public television is America's largest classroom and we serve as the leading source of digital learning tools for preschool teachers and K through 12 classrooms. As classrooms become more connected, our content becomes an even more valuable teaching tool. The PBS Kids website averages more than 11 million unique visitors per month. And in 2013, more minutes were spent viewing children's videos on pbskids.org than any other children's site. The collection of more than 35 PBS Kids mobile apps has been downloaded more than 10 million times. Local public television stations like KVIE do all of this because of our public service mission. We are more than broadcasters. We are here to serve the communities that we are individually licensed to and address their unique needs and reflect their diversity. We don't do this for ratings. We don't do it for membership pledges. We do this because of our commitment to public service and the communities we serve. To be clear, KVIE and the public television industry take no specific position on the current net neutrality proposal. We make no recommendations on the regulatory scheme or authority that works best. As I mentioned earlier in my testimony, as a provider of video content with a growing number of our viewers accessing our content online, it is important to us that everyone have full, unrestricted access to the wide array of educational content and services that we provide on whatever platform they wish to receive it. We fervently hope that this panel and the FCC will appreciate that for all of the broadband innovations and services I've described today, Broadcasting remains at the heart of what we do, and its one to millions communications architecture remains an extraordinarily efficient and effective use of the spectrum we steward for the American people. We are honored to serve everyone, everywhere, every day, for free, using all the platforms that modern technology enables. And we are profoundly grateful for the federal funding that makes this remarkable public-private partnership possible. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts and this record of service and progress with you today. Thank you, David. Now our last witness, certainly not the least, <laughs> I'd like to welcome Melissa Rosenberg, a very successful Hollywood screenwriter and producer representing the Writers Guild of America West. Melissa has written all five screenplays for The Vampire Phenomenon, The Twilight Saga. Altogether, the five films have grossed over $3 billion worldwide, making Melissa the most successful female screenwriter of all time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Melissa also spent four seasons as both head writer and executive producer of the Showtime original series Dexter. Her work on the show helped earn it the prestigious Peabody Award, three Emmy nominations, three Writers Guild of America Award nominations, and two Golden Globe nominations. Melissa is currently the creator of an upcoming Marvel Netflix series set for 2015. We look forward to seeing that. Thank you, Melissa, for being here, and we're waiting for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Matsui. It's an incredible honor to be here as a uh, born and bred Californian to be in uh, my state's capital for the first time and speaking with you is... is uh, Really an honor, and, and thank you also to the commissioners Clyburn and Rosenworcel. Uh, I'm uh, in awe of what all three of you do, uh, and I aspire to be you. <laughs> the, um, as you said, my name is Melissa Rosenberg. Uh, I am a screenwriter and a television writer producer, and I've made a career telling stories involving heroes and villains and occasional serial killers. But you know. <laughs> um, but the, the heroes and villains are regularly called upon to do the fantastic and sometimes even the impossible. And as a female screenwriter in a male-dominated, globalized industry, I know the feeling. <laughs> also, as a screenwriter who adapted the Twilight novels, I feel uniquely qualified to speak, out about, to speak about media consolidation and Internet public policy issues thanks to my extensive knowledge with vampires and werewolves. Sadly, the real life story has much of the gore, go, excuse me, has much of the gore, uh, but none of the romance. At the stake is the very ability of storytellers like myself to tell the stories we want to tell, to tell diverse stories that offer insight and inspiration that, that allow viewers to, to expand their understanding of other cultures 
and to encourage them to tap into their own imaginations to express themselves. And right now anyone can do it. All they need is an internet connection. It is, so this is the thrilling tale of an open internet in which the fundamental American values of free speech and fair competition are threatened by the villainy of monopoly power and corporate censorship. Where the only hope for a happy ending is the reclassification of internet access services and the successful application of net neutrality. <laughs> Fortunately, there are heroes among us, including Congresswoman Matsui, who has proposed legislation recognizing the need to ban paid prioritization, thus presenting internet service pr providers, ISPs, from becoming online gatekeepers. And the commissioners, Clyburn and Rosenworcel, Rosen who are doing valuable work to develop strong net neutrality rules. But there's still much drama still to come. In the story so far, the free and open internet has worked like, a, like traditional telephone lines. When consumers use a phone, they can call whomever they want. No co phone company can limit whom they can reach. Likewise, consumers choose where they want to go online. An ISP doesn't decide what legal content has preferential access or what is regula regulated to a slow lane. The free market and fair competition enabled by this structure have revolutionized communication democratic discourse, social engagement, and commerce. And in the entertainment industry, it has provided a surprising plot twist. After decades of consolidation, seven corporations control almost everything we see on conventional TV and in movie theaters. For writers, this means they control what we create. Uh, we should be used to this. It's really the history of media in the 20th century has a repeated chorus of emerging technologies with open distribution platforms which were inevitably corporatized and globalized by a small handful of conglomerates. It happened to us in motion pictures, radio, broadcast television, and then cable television. But with the rise of the internet as a new platform for video distribution, one where anyone can reach an, honest, uh, an audience, we have a chance to re-empower content providers. For women and people of color especially, who are underrepresented as actors, writers, and directors, the open internet provides a new opportunity to participate in the creation of both our national culture as well as the global economy. This is not just a, a writer's fantastic vision of the future. With the rapid growth of online video market, the open internet is delivering on its promises. Today, four video streaming sites make up more than half of all fixed internet traffic. In 2013, advertisers and consumers spent $6 billion on internet video services and that amount is rising. This demand has created a new market for original professional video programming where hundreds of Writers Guild members have begun to work and countless new creative voices have begun to, to appear. I include myself in this group as I'm currently the showrunner of an upcoming, upcoming Netflix series based on a Marvel comic superhero, Jessica Jones. The internet sep, uh, represents our greatest opportunity to reintroduce competition for what we create and what consumers can choose to watch. It's why I joined with almost 250 TV and online series creators and showrunners in a letter to the FCC, uh, Chairman Wheeler, urging him to set aside the proposal to allow ISPs to become online content gatekeepers. And more than 1,200 of my fellow Guild members have emailed comments to the SEC urging the Commission to reclassify Internet service. The SEC may continue uh, on its outline path, but this has already led to the chairman, uh, the chairman to propose a tiered Internet with fast and slow lanes. This path gives the ISPs the power to put their thumb on the scale and determine market winners and losers. Allowing ISPs to push aside new competition serves neither innovation nor the best interests of our society. The free market where consumers hold the power to decide what content they prefer will be lost. There is, however, another way. It is for the, commissioner, to the Commission to reclass, reclassify Internet service and inter institute rules that ban blocking and discrimination. This is the only way to preserve a free market where consumers control access to the content, services, and applications of their choice. And so we arrive at the turning point of the story, 
Will the Internet's open forum for free speech and enterprise be turned into a walled fortress of content control? Will entertainment, information, and marketing platforms be readily available to all or just those who can afford to pay for them? Will new media be dominated by the gatekeepers that dominated old media? The climax of the story is yet to be written. The policy decisions that triggered the consolidation of old media have not yet been finalized for new media. There is still time to protect the rights of content producers, entrepreneurs, and especially consumers, regardless of their socioeconomic status. The FCC needs to reclassify Internet access services and establish strong net neutral neutrality rules to ensure that the Internet remains a level playing field for all. The entertainment industry is filled with oxymorons, from jumbo shrimp to Hollywood accounting. <laughs> Allow me to add one more. If the Internet is to survive as a free and open means of content and creation and market-driven competition, we must win the fight for neutrality. Thanks very much. It's an honor to be here. Ooh. Thank you very much, Melissa, for that uh, informative and engaging presentation. <laughs> um, now is the time for uh, us to ask questions here. So if you can be as succinct as possible, because I intend to ask every single one of you, and I know to do the same. Uh, this has been wonderful, and I think each of you brought something to the table which was diverse and, uh, for a lot of people, unknown to a great degree. Commissioner Sandoval, um, you focused on a lot of things in your uh, testimony, including water and power and all of that. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about the health care system, which you touched upon. It's increasingly relying on Internet-enabled devices and technology, and the nation is migrating to an Internet of Things universe. And I think one of the unintended consequences of pay partisanship is its ability to distort the market for the delivery of critical services, such as health care. Can you briefly discuss the impact paid privatization deals could have on our hospital systems? Yes, thank you very much, Congresswoman Metsui. I had the honor last week of speaking with uh, Dr. Hogarth at the UC Davis uh, School of Medicine who manages their telemedicine program. And he gave me an example of how uh, fast internet with high resolution cameras is critical to the outcome and indeed the life of burn victims. So he was reporting that today through video consultations using high resolution internet and high resolution, high speed internet and high, high resolution cameras, they are able to take a burn victim who might go to a rural clinic in the outer parts of Kern County where there is no burn specialist. And he said that, of course, a lot of burn victims are also in shock, but that they're notoriously unable to describe the depth and extent of their burn. But by using these vi internet enabled video cameras, a burn specialist and surgeon is able to look at it to see the extent of the burn, the color, the depth of the burn, and also fluid weeping from the burn, which is very important because as you lose your skin, you lose fluid. And so that surgeon then is able to ask the doctors to administer a certain amount of IV fluid which is absolutely critical because if this IV fluid is not administered and the person is just put on the helicopter, if they, if they make it alive to the emergency center where the burn specialist is located, they will arrive in renal failure. So this intervention prevents people from that loss and it also helps a better patient outcome because they can also do at that rural hospital and out of Kern interventions that will not only save the patient's life but re also result in less scarring. And you also asked about how this is related to the Internet of Things. One uh, really important in event, uh, invention is now the use of smart beds in hospitals. So a bed is not just something you lie on in a hospital anymore. It can also take your heart rate. It can take your vitals. And it is also interconnected so that not only can the nurses see it, but the data is aggregated through big data about smart beds and then interconnected to other uh, firefighters, to emergency services, to disaster planners, so that if a disaster uh, strikes, like right now we have terrible fires raging in many places in California, like the King Fire, information is available to emergency specialists about where beds are available in which 
which types of units throughout the state through the aggregated data made possible by smart beds and the internet of things and that invention was made possible because people recognized a bed didn't have to be just a bed it could be a diagnostic tool internet enabled and they didn't have to ask any isps for permission about how to use their bandwidth to accomplish that thank you thank you um rivka sometimes i think that uh, we, including many in Washington, D.C., take for granted the open Internet that we all currently enjoy. As a librarian, really at the ground level, serving the people in Sacramento, can you talk about the importance of an open and accessible Internet for everyone in the community rather than a system that is divided up between haves and have-nots? Thank you. That, that's a wonderful question. Well, there, specifically here in Sacramento County, 16% of, of everyone who lives here lives below the poverty line. So what we're able to do as a library in providing access is, is priceless in my opinion. And to compromise that or threaten it threatens our ability to help raise people above the access that we provide allows us to provide those services that, that people often don't have access to elsewhere. Uh, and when I think about things like a small store online who all of a sudden would have to pay, uh, you know, can't compete with a large store, there's, a, there's an impact on the retail economy. There's an impact on libraries. If we were shunted to a slow lane in terms of the content we're able to provide, there's an impact on the innovation and the incubation that we're allowed and able to provide to our community. I, I brought along a little tool today that was fabricated in one of our libraries using a 3D printer. Um, the, the, the prototype was, was done on the 3D printer because a young man heard about it, used the library to prototype it, did a Kickstarter campaign, raised $70,000, and is now retailing these items. That's the spirit of innovation that that free and open access provides. And I would hate to see that compromised. Thank you, Rivka. Chris Kelly, in your testimony, you stated that paid prioritization amounts to a tax on innovation. I agree. If you're starting a new business or a startup in Sacramento or Silicon Valley and pay prioritization with the law of the land, how would that impact your ability to attract capital and investment and ultimately the success of that small startup or business, small business? Well, it makes it a huge challenge because it adds a, a further layer of things that as an investor you have to evaluate or as an entrepreneur that you need to, to try to cover. You've got to be ready to explain to investors how you're going to relate to you know, getting quick Internet access, um, especially if you rely upon it, if you're talking about any sort of higher bandwidth business where you want to provide uh, reviews of local, you know, of local, uh, you know, restaurants, for instance, through uh, through video. If you had a video demand at that point, you, you, the first the first question in the investment discussion would be about, well, what's your relationship with the ISPs to make sure that you actually can get to the consumers at the end of the day? You know, distribution is the coin of the realm in internet businesses. And if you have to add another question about uh, about how you get distribution, um, capital is going to freeze up and fairly quickly. Essentially, it should just be a given. You shouldn't have to think about it then. Uh, at all. You, you don't right now. Yeah. The, the, that possibility of reaching millions of consumers right away and having that potential uh, is, is there. And with paid prioritization, it could go away pretty quickly. Thank you. David, from the perspective of a public broadcaster with limited financial resources, if pay for priority scheme were in place, would it add to the difficulties of growing KVIE's online presence? Um, as I, I mentioned, as an industry, we don't have a position on the proposal. It, it's a huge issue, and we're still working through our processes on that. Um, but certainly as a not-for-profit broadcaster, um, it is, we're always focused on our funding in addition to serving our public mission. So um, we believe that our content should be available for everybody in the most accessible way. Thank you, David. Melissa, millions of Americans are now watching their 
favorite television shows or movies online, whether it's Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, and so forth. Because of the internet, your great work writing some of our favorite shows and movies are available anytime, anywhere, with a touch of a screen. I understand you're working on this new series, a Marvel Comics series for Netflix, which relies solely on high-speed broadband internet for the delivery of the content. Can you speak about how pay-for-priority schemes would impact the abilities by you or any other creative talents to use the internet as a platform to get their contact, content distributed? How about the consumers who go online to look for programming? How will their choices be affected or distorted? Well, we've certainly seen it in uh, previous uh, models of broadcast television and film. and. You know, if you want to see the sequel number seven to that last ser ser uh, uh, superhero, you know, there, it's, it's getting narrow and narrow, the d diversity. There is, you know, predominantly male and predominantly white. And I think, you know, that is such a huge part of what uh, of my passion for this issue is to really bring all stories to it. And the, so the, if, if the Internet rules are... Uh, e where all data and content are created equally, you create a level playing field. And, and consumers decide what they want to watch. It's not a boardroom of predominantly white male people from the town. You're like, oh, yes, everybody wants to see what that 13-year-old boy wants to see, which is how the movie business has turned into what it is, by the way. Um, that's why I work in TV right now. Uh, so... Allowing paid fast lanes will undermine the fundamental nature of what's made the internet so great at the moment. You know, requiring companies to pay for faster access will reduce inve investment in content and cede all power to companies that can afford to pay. And that means fewer outlets and less content. And you know, the return of the father of the son of superhero number XYZ. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. And I think I found it very interesting, and I think it's very true that this has opened the door for younger people, women, um, minorities, in a way that they had difficulty accessing um, to be able to be a screenwriter or to be able to do creative things. And very uh, much so. I see that in my business all the time. People who are getting rejected at the broadcast networks or film studios. Uh, because they they seemingly are oh that's going to play there's that's just for a black audience okay so that's not big enough for that you know so that person goes creates that pro that content online creates a show gets you know viewers and you go back to those broadcasts and suddenly they're chasing the broadcast is chasing them now and it just expands it and it it takes off the narrow binders of what are, what's going to sell what's who's who are the audience and what's going to sell. Uh, because it's just people expressing who they are and expressing their stories. I think it's essential for viewers. I, as a viewer myself, I uh, I'm feel very strongly about it. Thank you, Melissa. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. And, and since you're uh, speaking, Ms. Rosenberg, just wanted to let you know I'm still in therapy from my first few Dexter episodes. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll be glad to know my 12 out of uh, my family are shrinks as well, so thanks for that, too. Okay, well, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure what the ethics rules are, but I might need to talk to you. Um, so I wanted to, um, you know, affirm something that you said that I feel real strongly about in terms of um, what an enabler uh, this platform has been. I had an opportunity to have a meeting with Issa Rae, who's just a remarkable talent that, to be honest, uh, I wish I could see more of her content um, as I flip, um, you know, through the um, screens and um, and, and pay um, a couple of dollars for a, a movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but you know, I wanted to talk to you um, or, or address in, in sort of two-part, sort of semi-unrelated questions about how um, for these newer writers, you know, how the dynamics have, have truly changed. And, and you mentioned that. Um, and, and what what is your um, goal and wish for them, and you talked about that, but um, when you talk about the proper application of open internet rules, when we talk about it to wireless, from wireless perspective, and when I mentioned, um, as everyone knows, uh, the uh, the number of persons migrating on that um, wireless platform, 
does that influence the way writers and, and the way creators approach things? And you know, what does this all mean? And it's particularly as it relates to you know what we talk about, um, you know, priority arrangements. Tell me, you know, I'm asking you, um, but it all kind of, you, you're a writer, so I don't even worry about you distilling it and, and flowing. <laughs> um, and I'm really serious about that therapy bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get a referral. Okay, thank you. Um, so you're talking about the wireless versus the right, and, and, and knowing that you know, oftentimes when a, there's an online engagement, there's a, a populations that um, rely strictly on this. What does that mean for writers? Um, is it a positive? Is it a negative? What is it? Um? You know, it's uh, well. First of all, pretty much every young person I know, and in my industry is full of them. They, they're absolutely all on wireless, and and you know that. So, but what's true for us is that story is story. There is no difference whatsoever. We, you tell a story and how it gets viewed, uh, the only thing that might matter is if you're actually aiming for a cell phone uh, movie, you might not do, you know, um, Gone with the Wind right, with a right. scene where, and then Atlanta burns, yeah. you know, might not play on a cell phone. But other than that, a story is a story is a story. Absolutely. It does not matter where it plays or how it plays, whether it be wireless or broadband or, or you know, anywhere else. Okay. And um, you, uh, Mr. Lowe, I know you're not taking a position, um, but I'm wondering um, if there are any currents con continue, continuing on the mobile theme. Um, it, you, you talked about you know, your, your platform and, and how more people are you know, going um, and, and, and consuming you know, online. I'm wondering if you have any concerns that you wish to uh, address or anything you would like for us to consider as it relates particularly, again, on mobile. Being the most available in whatever platform is at the foundation of what we do. So PBS is available to almost 100% of all Americans for free because of our broadcast services. And the more that our video is consumed online, we believe that that also needs to be available in the most universally accessible way. Okay. And uh, you know, Mr. Kelly, you you've answered this, and, and thank you, Congresswoman, for taking my question. But that's okay. <laughs> we we like you anyway. Um, <laughs> you know. What elements do we need to, um, you know, consider as it relates to, uh, you know, investors talk about certainty, um, you know, that's the, that's your refrain. Mm -hmm. And so, what types of, um, in, in terms of policies, what are the say three to five key elements that need to be um, present in order to make sure that, um, you know, you are um, open for business and open for um, engagement? Well, I mean, I I think that. Primarily the focus on, on borrowing pay prioritization is, is the number one through five things that, 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 okay. that can and should, should be done in, in this area because that additional uncertainty that, that matches with a business model, with a, you know, outreach efforts, with the entrepreneurs that, that you're dealing with you know, individually, their skills, the, 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 the networks that they have personally, you know, adding the how's your relationship with the ISP to actually get the distribution, it, it would be a radical change in, um, in, in how things operate. I mean, we, we at Facebook, when I joined, we had about 2 million people on our platform, largely through university broadband services. If, if we'd had to go out and negotiate with every ISP across America to get Facebook access on people's phones or in their homes, that would have been a huge disincentive to the investment in Facebook um, by others and would have been a, a huge distraction from the, the building of the service and the innovation in terms of newsfeed and all the different things that, that the companies provide. Understood. And uh, Commissioner, um, wanted, uh, we often work together, uh, as you mentioned, um, as federal state partners. Uh, tell me how that partnership needs to uh, continue or to be enhanced um, when we talk about maintaining a free and open Internet. Well, thank you very much. So, um, you know, first of all, I think it's also to understand the role of the state commissions and to collaborate. Um, so Commissioner Clybert, of course, has had the honor of also being a state commissioner. And uh, the duty of also supervising energy and water utilities, as well as other uh, common carriers and telephone corporations that have a statutory duty of safety and reliability. So I think understanding what it means to regulate these other industries that are critical industries that have have safety duties and standards uh, really is very important to understanding this because if the internet is not reliable then it's undermined 
So in a couple of quick examples, so I talked about Lifeline. Mm -hmm. So with Lifeline in California, um, in January, the CPUC unanimously uh, uh, reformed and modernized our Lifeline program to include access to mobile. So I had the honor of being the assigned commissioner in the Lifeline proceeding. And we were very concerned that many Americans throughout the country were running out of minutes because the federal Lifeline program has no minimum number of minutes. So we decided that you know, for California to be willing to put its money there, and we, we pay the equivalent of what we pay for wireless, uh, for wireline lifeline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we decided that the wireless provider would have to offer at least 1,000 minutes a month to be eligible for the maximum payment in, from California's own okay. fund, which is $12.65. So California is paying more than the federal government, and what this has resulted in is a subsidy of up to $22.50, and in tribal areas plus another $25, mm -hmm. given their remoteness for Lifeline. This is why now we are enrolling at least 30,000 people a month in Lifeline, mm -hmm. and the way that people are being enrolled is that the carriers, the companies who are approved to participate are often going out to fairs, they're in places where people congregate, they're at libraries, and they're sitting there with mobile devices to be able to input the people's information, upload it through the cloud. They can also use this to be able to scan and take pictures of documents so that then the documents can get uploaded as well through our internet-enabled system so that we can verify income eligibility. We are the only state doing 100% income verification. Right. And in fact, I wanted to thank the FCC for collaborating with us on developing your own uh, Lifeline database, which was largely modeled after California. So the investments that have been made on the private side to enable that, on the public side, on the state side, all of our work is absolutely critical. And understanding how mobile platforms are useful to that verification, plus how they enable new services. The last thing I'll say in that is one of the things that we're able to imagine now with this internet mobile enabled world is that we just unanimously adopted in our CARE program, California Alternative Rates for Energy, an ESAP, Energy Savings Assistance Program, where California spends in the course of three years, a three-year cycle, more than $5 billion to support energy uh, um, affordability for low-income people mm -hmm. and to provide energy efficiency measures in the home. So one of the things that I put in the order and our, my colleagues unanimously adopted is that we asked uh, the utilities to work with Lifeline providers and other utilities to develop a Care ESAP mobile app. And um, this is something that I, I um, ideated at a hackathon that where, where I helped to initiate an Apps for Energy hackathon that then became the model for the DOE, American Energy Data Challenge hackathon. And I'm very proud to say that last month, sdg e was the first utility to create a mobile app that will allow people to be able to apply for Karen ESAP through an app and uh, it will save uh, the utility money, it will save ratepayers money, and it will help get people the assistance that they need, and it will help save California energy so that we don't have to build fossil fuel polluting power plants. Thank you. Well, uh, I appreciate that. And, and I know I'm out of time, so I, I want to, this will be a lightning round, um, Dingle-inspired um, oh, uh, yeah. question. So how can, it, you know, for, for all, um, you mentioned rule call completion in, in that too, so maybe you can weave that quickly into this answer, but how can the FCC ensure that open internet rules protect all consumers, including most vulnerable consumers, such as lower income populations and individuals with disabilities? I don't know if, if you've had um, something, and then I'll speak um, I'll start with you, um, Commissioner, and if you could weave in, um, uh, you know, how you uh, see the open internet rules, um, you know, um, uh, once again in terms of rule call completion, um, if you could weave that in that I'd, I'd quickly, because um, my uh, the general lady is being very kind, but I know she's, I can feel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That's an important question because the FCC's NPRM doesn't even mention the impact on other common carriers or, for example, on TTY. The only place that TTY is mentioned is at the very end. If you if you search for TTY, TTY, it tells you how you can get a copy of the NPRM, but it doesn't actually contemplate what would be the 
the impact of this proposal on the deaf and disabled who are making calls. So for rural call completion issues, part of the question is that as you know, uh, Commissioner, you led when you were acting chairman and all of you unanimously adopted an order to help to stop rural call completion problems and impose obligations on everyone, VOIP providers, intermediaries, telephone corporations, everyone to make sure that calls got through. So paid prioritization and negotiations that could result in holdups at the server level that you don't even know about could interfere with the duty to terminate common carrier calls. And right now, when there are fires raging through California, there are evacuations, there are reverse 911 calls that is more important than ever. And last, I would submit to you, if you look at the Comcast users form, there are people who are, who are complaining that during the dispute with Cogent over Netflix, that they were having problems not only getting League of Legends, but that they also were having problems getting certain VOIP services. And when you look up those VOIP services, those are interconnected services VOIP services that have 911 and E911 obligations. So the concern that we have may have already happened. So this is an issue that um, I, I am asking our commission to follow up on and I suggest, I, I respectfully suggest that the Federal Communications Commission consider as well. Thank you. And Ms. Sass, you're in a unique position, um, you know, seeing all uh, consumers. Um, so if you would weigh in, I would appreciate it. As far as I'm concerned, the most important thing that you can do is eliminate any discussion of paid prioritization. The, I know this comes, I know that the whole issue of net neutrality is not new. I remember that we, we had this discussion about eight years ago because if, you, if, if John Oliver didn't educate us all this time, Ask a Ninja did in 2006. So I, I want to just bring us back to in 2014, our issues haven't changed as, as librarians, and we need to know that we can provide equal access to everybody we serve, and that the content has to be, we have to be able to provide content, and the platform has to be neutral. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, I know you don't see where you might logically um, weigh in, but if you could weigh in, including um, the assertion by some um, that pay prioritization might actually help startups compete with larger um, and more established, um, you know, competitors. I know you might disagree with that position, but if you could weigh that in as we... Um, yeah, I, I do disagree with it because it, it, it then, you know, you're, you're optimizing for a, you know, the wrong thing uh, at that point. You know, what startups are supposed to be doing is, is serve underserved populations, figure out how to aggregate them, you know, and build business models around that. Um, instead, you're building business models around, you know, fast access in, instead of, you know, instead of thinking about how, you know, people are going to be able to be empowered and innovate. And it actually connects as well um, to your last question about serving underserved communities because, you know, access is the key factor for allowing all of these different populations to get online, express themselves, build their own businesses and outreach ability. Um, we just have an incredible challenge in terms of allowing people access to the, the interconnect, interconnectivity, which is critical to, to operating. You know, we can serve massive numbers of people in underserved populations by making sure that everybody has the same access. Ms. Um, there are still a, a number of attendant issues along with net neutrality that we're working on as an industry and understanding through our process. But certainly we would like to reach and serve as many people as possible in as many ways as possible so people get what they want when they want it. And last but not least. Um, it, for me, this is so important what you're doing now and he, just, you know, understanding that everyone has a story to tell and whether they're professionals who get paid for it or the kid who just came out of high school, you know, every person in this room has a story to tell. And to, to narrow the opportunity for them to do that is to, is to damage our uh, course, cultural discourse, to, to uh, limit our, our perspective of the world and understanding of our fellow Americans. So I, uh, you are doing it already. You're, you're hearing that content uh, providers, that storytellers, uh, could be uh, limited by the rule, 
violate any rules on this, and we want just open access to be able to for everyone to tell their stories. Thank you, and Congresswoman, Commissioner, thank you so very much for being so generous. And I, I know I went well over five minutes. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you, um, Mr. Kelly. Let's not name names, <laughs> but. Are there some big prominent websites we all know or applications we all use today that you don't think could have gotten started in a world with paid prioritization? Uh, I've happily already outlined um, the Facebook issue. Obviously, we had special um, cases uh, with the access to direct um, university broadband for, uh, for our early adopters, but as Facebook expanded, um, it would have been an incredible challenge to have to go through these negotiations with major telecommunications providers. And, and you know, our product team, you know, would have had to get involved in it. We would have had to thought, think about a whole bunch of different issues um, that could have derailed the massive innovation that we've seen that's now serving more than a billion people worldwide. Um, that challenge is something that, that startups shouldn't be thinking about most of the time. They should be thinking about how do we develop great products that interact and connect with people um, through this open internet and allow the people themselves on the other side to decide how much time they want to spend on them. Um, you know, as, as Facebook has expanded and has, and has networked the world in a, you know, and serves as, as an effective identity layer on the internet, um, people have chosen to use it, and people have chosen to protest against it, and people have chosen to do, to do a whole bunch of different you know things and and, and use this expression tool. Um, it, it it is hard to see the type of penetration that it would have if it, if if we had had to go through deep negotiations with every telecom provider every time to figure out um, how we're going to actually get to users who are demanding use of the product. Uh, it's it's a you know, it's just something that startups shouldn't be focused on. And if we, you know, allow gatekeepers to make those choices, um, you're stifling what consumers are already demonstrating by their use of networks. Mr. Lowe, I am one of those original Sesame Street kids that I grew up with Big Bird and friends. Mm -hmm. But my kids, they're digital natives. Their world is not only broadcasting. They access a lot of PBS programming, with my permission, <laughs> online. So we're very familiar in my household with pbskids.org and all of your apps. And my question for you is, do you worry that in a world of paid prioritization, that could really raise your costs and diminish your effectiveness and the number of kids you could reach? Um, I'm glad to hear that you're using those apps, and there's another one you should use if you don't already. It's called Supervision, and it's an app that you can use to monitor their screen time because they shouldn't be using that much screen time. They really need to go out and play as well. Um, <laughs> but I do hope that when they are using screen time, it is educational content like Sesame Street, Super Y, Curious George, and, and the many others. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are a lot of issues around net neutrality with paid prioritization, pay to play, open platform, those kinds of things. And again, um, for, for us, those are really big issues that as an industry, we're trying to make sure that we understand and work through our process. Um, but certainly as nonprofit broadcasters focused on providing the best public service possible, funding is always a challenge. And we're constantly focused on serving our mission and making sure that we have the funds to do so. So anything else that distracts us from that, um, you know, is an issue. Ms. Sass, you know that I'm a big fan and champion of the E-Rate program, which helps bring high-speed connectivity to all of our nation's schools and libraries. And I think one of the neat things about that connectivity is in libraries, it's being used for education in so many ways. And online education is growing. In some ways, that's for the high school student who wants to brush up on some of the things they're learning at school. It's for people, as you mentioned, who've fallen through the cracks and might be getting their GED. And it's for workforce education, too, which I'll submit is only going to grow more important in the years ahead. So I'm worried that paid prioritization would have an impact on the ability of library patrons to use those educational resources. Tell me what you think. Well, I absolutely agree with you. 
currently, the library subscribes to about 40 different electronic resources that do everything from online tutoring to help children and adults uh, complete a course. We offer foreign language instruction through Rosetta Stone. We offer uh, any number of resources. If paid prioritization becomes the priority for us, then that limits our ability to provide access to those resources and our community, which 15% of which doesn't have a high school diploma, 16% of which lives below the poverty line, to access the, those resources. So it's incredibly important that we be able to continue providing access to, to as broad an array of content that, as we can and not be relegated to the slow lane. Ms. Rosenberg. As we can tell from your testimony, you're one of those creative types. We could use you in Washington and <laughs> jazz up some of our hearings. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for me, I'm a consumer. And the thing that strikes me is in the past several years, the explosion of platforms that I can get content on is tremendous. I know it's good for you as writers, but it's also terrific for us as consumers. And I worry in a world where paid prioritization becomes the norm that that explosion would cease and we wouldn't find that many more new platforms would develop. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think up until this explosion outside of traditional broadcast, uh, there, all of us were focusing on what, to, what story to tell that will sell. Uh, versus what story do we want to tell? What story is it, what's important, uh, an important story to tell? And then it started expanding into cable and now you have Netflix and YouTube and Hulu and uh, Amazon Prime and there's all these places where you can tell story and it's, um, it, it's an extraordinarily exciting time right now for viewers as well. I mean, you know, I have a hard time keeping up with all these incredible, pro it's really the rebirth of, of um, the uh, storytelling in, in uh, entertain, filmed entertainment. You know, I think um, it's very interesting because you know, I, well, film was uh, movies were the were the lead uh, on all of this, and it, that was the you know you always wanted to be a big screenwriter. No, people are now they don't they want to go create something on the web. They want to go and tell that that's that is the goal. If you go to a film school, that's the goal because they can do what they want to do. And it just makes for amazing viewing. I mean, just it's such an exciting time. And I really, uh, to stifle that would be just uh, creatively a disaster, I think. I agree. <laughs> from, one, from one who's just watching. Uh, last but not least, Commissioner Sandoval, you know what I loved at the start of your testimony? You talked about public safety. The impact of network neutrality and its relationship with public safety is something that we have not discussed enough in Washington. And in your role as a state commissioner, you're closer to a lot of essential infrastructure, you're closer to the ground, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Thank you very much, and thank you as well for your commitment to public safety. I know that you uh, make it a priority to visit public safety answering points wherever you go, and I would note that this proposal does not even exempt public safety answering points, and it is critical that everybody be able to reach public safety answering points. So let me answer your question in part by telling you how a blackout works. Um, so in California, we don't have brownouts. We only have blackouts. So um, the power is either on or it's off. And that's for a lot of reasons. When you have brownouts, you can actually fry computers and devices, and I have seen computers fried by poor power. Um, so when the San Onofre nuclear power plant went out after uh, a small leak on uh, Jan January 31st of, uh, of 2012, um, Southern California, an area where 26 million people live, in one minute lost 20% of their power. All right, so over time, uh, Southern California Edison, which is the primary operator of that plant, along with the city of Riverside and San Diego Gas and Electric, identified uh, four particular substations, electric substations in Orange County, as most at risk um, because they were, so, they were closer to the San Onofre nuclear power plant and all of San Diego County. 
Okay, and so keeping in mind that we're talking about the place that hosts the second largest city in America, um, which is actually served by LADWP, and um, its surrounding region, which is bigger than the city of Los Angeles, and another one of the top 10 cities in America, San Diego. All right, so the system was designed so that having lost 20% of the power, we had to call on every resource and get absolutely, be absolutely, uh, you know, creative about what we were going to do. And demand response was absolutely critical. And what was important is that this, you had to be able to get load to power down if you were in a situation where demand was too high and you didn't have enough resources because you had 20% that you had just lost for your power. So a couple of things happened. One, we, there, uh, the utilities have now had programs for years, which they're expanding, which do auto communication to interruptible load. Um, for example, there's a little device that could be put on uh, your um, outside return for your air conditioner that if the demand is too high, the utility sends a signal to it and it basically turns down your air conditioner and reduces demand on the grid. All right, so there are a number of those types of things that work on what we call auto DR. Another important part of component of DR is communication to people to get people to act because people can also opt out of those auto DR situations, including the, their thermostats. So mobile has been absolutely critical to that as the utilities uh, tweet, uh, email, Facebook, uh, use, uh, use a number of call, use a number of different means, text to be able to ask people to power down. And what happened in 2012, as we knew that these four particular substations were most at risk, is that the system was set up so that if demand was too high in order to prevent a cascading power failure that would black out not only SE territory, but all of Southern California and, the, and a bad cascade can continue as it did. We've already had a blackout when somebody made a mistake in Arizona and it managed to black out not only Imperial County, but all of San Diego and Northern Mexico. Um, so these four power plants, uh, these four substations um, basically were set up and the system was alarmed so that if power demand was too high and demand response did not come through, load wasn't reduced, then it was set up so that, um, you know, the, they could press a button and go ahead and enable the system. You can enable the time. So as I recall, and I'm, I'm maybe a little off about the numbers, but basically if demand wasn't reduced within 15 minutes, then the first substation would be blacked out. Okay, hospitals, PSAPs, police stations, everything, boom, power's blacked out. All right, now, because they're interconnected, if the energy demand doesn't stabilize in the, in the next connected systems within, as I recall, it's 45 seconds, let's give it a minute, then the next substation blacked out. Hospitals, PSAPs, police stations, universities, everything blacked out, okay? Four substations black, can be blacked out if demand isn't lowered, and if that doesn't stabilize the system, then it grows. All right, so um, we, we, were never, we never had to get to that point of actually having blackout because of coordination and because the California Independent System Operator says that there was one day in particular in San Diego where demand response made the difference between blackout or not. But there was one day when Southern California Edison alarmed the system. They never had to push the button, but the alarm was ready to go. And DR is part of what's gonna keep us from getting there. Thank you. That's alarming. <laughs> <laughs> that is. And first of all, I want to thank you, um, everyone here, for being here in the audience and, and looking at this. And um, I'd like to thank the witnesses. You were so good, each and every one of you, bringing in your particular uh, viewpoints from where you were. And I just thought it was really remarkable. And thank you so much. I um, want to thank everybody here. I really particularly want to thank uh, my commissioners, Rosen Warso and Clyde Byrne, who are absolutely wonderful to work with. And I also want to let you know that we are going to be sharing this, this, all this information. Um, obviously, it's on official record of Energy and Commerce Committee and also the FCC. But I also feel that personally, I'm going to share this with the Energy and Commerce uh, Chairman and Ranking Members, Fred Upton and Henry Waxman, and also 
the uh, Communications and Technology Chairman and uh, Ranking Members, Greg Walden and Anna Eshoo, because all of us are very much engaged and interested in it, and I believe that this is particularly important because we are actually doing this outside of the Beltway and uh, engaging people who really feel the importance of this, individuals who actually engage other people in their various businesses or their roles, librarians or public broadcasters or writers. And uh, you all bring a particular perspective that is valuable because when you talk about, people talk about net neutrality, a lot of people don't understand that it really impacts every single person, whoever you are. So I do hope that the chairman uh, takes these testimonies to heart and with the commissioners here, really um, work to restore net neutrality rules that will protect both consumers and in innovators and encourage broadband investment and deployment. And most importantly, really continue to foster a healthy internet ecosystem. I really want to thank you all for being here. Uh, there's a historic opportunity here. I've never seen the FCC as engaged as it has been recently because it's important. Things have really changed in the last couple of years. Um, I remember when TiVo was a big deal. Remember? <laughs> you know, we can actually watch it whenever we want to watch it. Now it's just everything is so exciting now, and it's important that we make sure that the Internet is there for the future. I want to also thank Access Sacramento for providing the streaming um, online here for all of us, and they're absolutely wonderful here, too. And, uh, yes. And uh, thank you all. We let this hearing go a little bit longer because I thought it was important to really engage the witnesses in the manner that many times we can't engage in Washington, D.C. So thank you so much, and I'd like to um, declare that this hearing is adjourned. Uh, one example of, of this, and I used to watch this because the irony of this whole process is that